Hi, I'm Colonel Rob Epstein, Commander of the Air Force Agency for Modeling and Simulation, located here in Orlando, Florida. And today I'm going to talk to you about how the United States Air Force is looking to improve our training for our aviators by accelerating change. Next slide. Our new Chief of Staff, General C.Q. Brown, has thrown down the gauntlet for us to accelerate change or lose. Uh, August of 2020, he published an eight-page document with this vision and challenge to the United States Air Force. Uh, in it, he states, our Air Force must accelerate change to control and exploit the air domain to the standard the nation expects and requires from us. If we don't change, if we fail to adapt, we're going to lose the certainty with which we have defended our national interests for decades. We lose, we risk losing a high-end fight. We risk losing our airmen, our credibility, and our ability to secure our future. We must move with purpose. And we must accelerate change or lose in order to remain the most dominant and respected Air Force in the world. Uh, and hence we put this quote up, which is, we must contribute to the joint warfighting concept enabled by all domain command and control placing our capability in the warfighter's hands faster through innovation, experimentation, and rapid prototyping, and a collaborative approach to which our service and industry teammates can participate with us. At the end of the day, we cannot continue doing things the same way we have and expect to get the results in the future that we want. Next slide. So his predecessor, General Goldfein, uh, in 2017, signed out the Operational Training Infrastructure Flight Plan 2035. Uh, since then, we've expanded that to become the Operational Test and Training Infrastructure, but it's become more critical to our national defense and how we train our airmen for the future. Uh, there are a number of different things that make up OTI, but all of them are really based on the five goals, which is to restore readiness for the force, create a cost-effective modernization plan, drive innovation, develop exceptional leaders, and strengthen our alliances. If you look at the, the slide, right now we have an infrastructure that is very proprietary, vendor locked, um, and, and not at fault for anybody, but based on the way we acquired systems over the years. Uh, our training infrastructure is actually underfunded for what we need to achieve. And if you work your way around to the right, it's unencrypted, so the way we do our ranges today, uh, our pods need to be updated. Uh, all of our systems are not compatible with one another. Uh, at, at present time, we have over 26 threat generators, and most of which don't talk to each other. Um, we don't actually have the ability to access all of our information uh, for a number of reasons. Some of our training environments are actually unrealistic, which create negative training opportunities, and we've basically outgrown our ranges. We're at a time in history where we need to modernize our operational test and training infrastructure to realistically test and train against potential peer competitors. Next slide. So in the National Defense Strategy, it specifically talks about the emergence of China and Russia and how they continue to leverage technology to innovate and challenge U.S. superiority in the world. Uh, China is leveraging military modernization, influence operations, and predatory economics to coerce its neighboring countries to reorder the Indo-Pacific region to their advantage, while concurrently the Ru Russia seeks uh, to veto authority over nations on its proprietary or periphery in order uh, for them to reorganize and have control over their region. What does this mean to us? Right now, in the way we do training, we have a risk. Uh, in the top left, you can see that we have cybersecurity risk. We have to actually manage our legacy infrastructure to ensure that we don't actually lose information and allow our adversaries to receive that information and act upon that information. In the center, we have to, we have to continue to train without giving away any of our information. Uh, as you can see, uh, other countries around the world have actually collected data on us and actually stolen some of the technology that we have, which is giving them parity on the battlefield. So once again, we find ourselves in the, uh, a time of great state power competition, which is driving us to have to rethink the way we do business. No longer are we going to have that advantage in combat uh, and the superiority that we had uh, for the last 20 to 30 years. 
So currently the DoD process field solutions way too late. Innovation is the new battlefield. And if we're going to be on target, we're going to have to win against our adversaries by being able to outpace them and keep our tech as fresh as possible. Next slide. So one of the things we see is training is the key. If technology is on par with our adversaries, the only thing that gives you an advantage is how well trained you are. Uh, if you look at the top left there, our current trajectory of technologies is outpacing our training infrastructure's ability to keep up. So we see a point where our adversaries will actually be on par with us. That's unacceptable as we're defending the nation. Training is going to be the key in making sure that we have the infrastructure in place to actually train our aviators is, is going to be key. Uh, as you see the blue banner on top, U.S. air superiority is not an American birthright. The best trained airmen will not be, uh, or the best trained airmen will be the deciding factor in battle. Uh, the last chief of staff, General Goldfein, said this, uh, and it is in the national defense strategy. So how we're going to change is going to be key to how we do business in the future. And again, we talked about our live ranges. What we used to do live is becoming more and more difficult based on the technology that we own. Legacy technology is no longer meeting our needs, and the ranges don't have the airspace or the ability to allow us to conduct those types of operations. Uh, the other problem we have is our infrastructure right now, by not training the gap, um, is causing our airmen to feel like they're going back in time when they actually step into the training devices. So our games today are doing it, um, and that's why we put down Fortnite and other things like that. M massive online video games right now are streaming, centralized updates, and you know keeping their systems up to date. You know, lots of different players involved in the networks. We now have to design an infrastructure that isn't going to be so siloed and allow us to do the exact same things. We need to move into the future because our airmen are expecting us to do it. Next slide. So the phones that people are leaving outside of their secure facilities are actually easier to use, more interoperable, and more responsive to change than the technology that we have inside our vaults. And why is that? Again, I go back to this is how we've developed things over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, but it's time for us to make a change. It's time for us to actually take back control and create those ecosystems that allow our aviators to actually train together in a multi-role fashion. So technology has matured, but we haven't transitioned to this space yet. And so that's really what the Air Force Agency for Modeling and Simulation and the A3 are trying to drive so that our aviators are going to be able to train together. Fortnite, for example, is the world's most popular video game, and it's connecting all these players together across multiple different types of devices. Uh, if, you, if you look at the DCS World, another commercially available uh, flight simulator, um, significant uh, interoperability and connectivity that allows our, our folks to fly together in a common environment. These are things that you can play at home, but yet we haven't transitioned them to our distributed mission operations the way we need to. Uh, so not saying that this is actually the answer to our problem, but it shows that they can be addressed with technology, and these are the challenges that we're going to be facing in the next few years. Next slide. So what are our challenges right now um, with the technology and the challenges in our synthetic training environment? Uh, basically, our electromagnetic environment is not accurately represented in the training. Uh, this is going to be key for us to create a common environment, allowing the electromagnetic spectrum to act as it should. Uh, one of the examples I like to use is think of uh, a child splashing in a baby pool. If, if there are two children in two separate baby pools, those waves will not interact with one another because the pools aren't connected. We need to get to the point where we're all in the same swimming pool and the interactions are all uh, in the environment, allowing everybody to interact with one another. The world has to be the same. On that same idea, if, if you're creating that large swimming pool that everyone's going to be in together, you need to actually update the models uh, and keep authoritative data to allow everybody to be in the same place. We see this as by going to data-centric uh, environments and allowing 
the data stewards, the people who keep those models up to date to do just those things so that it isn't taking us you know, 6, 12, 18 months just to get an updated model and then give it to a vendor to update for us. It has to be something that as new systems show up, we can in inject them into the training environment to train to them almost immediately. And then last, existing training venues don't have the sufficient fidelity that we think we're going to see in a modern combat environment. Those need to increase. So we need to increase the fidelity to make training realistic and relevant. Uh, we have to avoid the negative training opportunities. We have to reinforce positive behavior, not negative behavior, and not let people walk away with the wrong lessons learned. So while they're learning to fly their airplane, we're very, very good at that. What we don't have is the ability to create those environments to let them train in a large environment where they're dealing with both other services and other countries and learning the proper procedures and workarounds in the simulator. Next slide. So how is this all going to evolve? The evolution of synthetic training right now, we see fourth gen aircraft, most of our training, uh, those are our, our current aircraft today, most of our training is done in the live environment with some done in the simulator. And there's moderate you know, risk uh, in the way we do business. But as we go to our fifth gen fighter aircraft, our F-35s or F-22s, more is being done in the sim than live and we're unable to adequately test and train against projected high-end adversaries in those environments. If we can't do it live and we can't do it in a training environment, the likelihood of success goes down drastically. And our sixth-gen aircraft uh, will be more simulator-related uh, than ever before. So we see ourselves in a, in a need to actually improve our simulated environment to allow our operators to get the training they need. Only going we're only going to need our simulators more in the future. And because of that, we have to deliver a better experience to all our operators. Next slide. So the training architecture and infrastructure of the future is what we're actually structured to build right now. So what are we doing about this? First off, we're going to build a purposeful built, a purpose built training environment, creating a synthetic environment which is going to enable realistic and high fidelity training across multiple generations of aircraft and is evolving constantly to make sure that it stays up to date. We need to address all the gaps uh, in this training right now, which is we have to create training devices that operate in that common picture. We can take them anywhere. We can use them deployed. We can use them on the way. We can use them at home station or in permanent built uh, structures. We don't have a limited number of uh, trainees that we're going to be able to put together. Again, as the future evolves, uh, it's very difficult to determine if it's going to be a set number of players or if this is going to be large-scale operations. We need an environment that allows us to scale and actually train them with exactly who they're going to be flying with and fighting with. And it's got to support multiple levels of training uh, at the same time. So it has to have that operational flexibility. What are we doing about it? Is actually looking to build a joint data-centric synthetic environment um, using synchronizing the functions uh, for computing so that we have both cloud-enabled and end computing going on to allow us to have data as the central structure, making sure that we have interoperability. We also see uh, building some sort of joint integrated training center, which is going to probably fulfill our immediate needs to have everybody together to fly together. So people would go to a, a facility, they would brief together, train together, and then be able to debrief together. And eventually, because of that data-centric environment that we're building, that'll be able to push out to be done via distributed operations worldwide. And the other last thing that we see is we really need to expand on what we've done with our F-35 program and take the JSE, the Joint uh, Simulation Environment, and use that as our baseline to put out our main operating bases uh, to create that sense of realism and high fidelity that's going to be required for our operators in the future. At the end of the day, the pilots need to be able to train how they're going to fight in a robust and adaptable virtual environment, leveraging all this technology that we've spoke about to make sure that the environment is not a detriment, but rather an attribute to the way they're going to train for the future. 
Next slide. Close by uh, our former uh, Secretary of the Air Force, uh, Dr. Wilson. The advantage will go to those who create the best technologies and who integrate and field them in a creative operational way that provide military advantage. What we see right now in the United States Air Force is to train our operators properly, we need to make sure that we're giving them the infrastructure that's going to allow them to create that sense of realism needed to be successful in combat in the future. And with that, I look forward to the live questions that you'll be hosting uh, with me in a few moments. Thank you very much.